In September 1956, Russian tanks rolled into Budapest to crush the Hungarian revolt against Soviet domination. The West's protests against Soviet brutality were confused, since Britain and France were engaged in their own adventure, the retaking of the Suez Canal from Egyptian control. But for some, a fairy tale seemed to come true, as Prince Rainier of Monaco married Hollywood's Grace Kelly. And another American superstar, Elvis Presley, started to shake up the world's youth and its music. Storms of another sort were shaking the prosperous British seaside resort of Eastbourne. For more than a century, Eastbourne has been home to large numbers of wealthy, retired people. But on Thursday, the 26th of July, this sedate and respectable town was rocked by the news that police were investigating the death of one of its richest and most well-known citizens. Mrs. Gertrude Bobby Hullett had died, apparently, of a drugs overdose. Only 49, Bobby Hullett had been being treated for depression following the death of her second husband, Jack. Her doctor, John Bodkin Adams, had also been tending Jack Hullett when he died about a year earlier of complications following a minor operation. Vivacious and popular, Bobby had swiftly become one of the leaders of Eastbourne society when she married Jack Hullett, a wealthy businessman, in 1951. The couple had been introduced by Dr. Adams, who had been treating Bobby for an earlier bout of depression following the death of her first husband. In 1954, Bobby had led Eastbourne's Parade of Elegance, one of the highlights of the social season, swathed in furs and walking ahead of her own gleaming Rolls Royce. But with the death of her husband, this world had collapsed. For the past four months, Bobby Hullett had had to be heavily sedated, and now she was dead. At the coroner's inquest, several curious facts emerged. Dr. Adams had rung the coroner on the 22nd of July to ask if a private post-mortem could be carried out on one of his patients. When the coroner asked when the patient had died, he was surprised to learn that she hadn't yet. Bobby Hullett had died the next day, and many of her friends found it difficult to believe that it was suicide. It emerged that three days before her death, Mrs. Hullett had remade her will leaving the Rolls-Royce to Dr. Adams. Bobby Hullett's body was examined forensically three times, the last by Britain's leading pathologist, Dr. Francis Capps. Based on their reports, the jury decided unanimously that she had committed suicide with an overdose of sleeping tablets. But press speculation became intense when it was revealed that Scotland Yard was investigating the deaths of several wealthy and elderly people. Both the detectives and reporters found that Bobby Hullett was not the first of Dr. Adams' patients to have died suddenly or to have left him a legacy. In fact, the doctor had become notorious for the excellence of his bedside manner when dealing with wealthy, elderly ladies. The cemeteries of Eastbourne had many graves of patients who had been very willing to remember Dr. Adams with substantial legacies in their wills. Fueled by some injudicious leaks from the police, the press was soon full of headlines such as Yard Probing Mass Poisoning, 25 Deaths in the Great Mystery of Eastbourne, and Enquiry into 400 Wills, Rich Women Believed to Have Been the Victims. Only one newspaper, the Daily Express, fought a lonely battle to uphold the right of a man to be presumed innocent until after a trial. 
The Express's crime correspondent, Percy Hoskins, was appalled by the stories which appeared in his rival's pages linking Adams to the police inquiries. For more than two months, Detective Inspector Herbert Hannam, who led the inquiry, and Detective Sergeant Charles Hewitt interviewed scores of people and oversaw an operation to look into the deaths and wills of hundreds of patients going back more than 20 years. The search turned up 132 wills in which the doctor had been left some 45,000 pounds. Many of the dead had been cremated, and there were cases where the doctor had failed to declare his interest as a beneficiary under the will. Had he done so, a post-mortem would have been necessary. In three cases where it was possible, the police did exhume the bodies of patients who had died suddenly, leaving the doctor substantial bequests. It was not until early October that Hannam happened to be passing Adam's house just as he was putting his car away. They got into conversation, and Hannam asked about the irregularities on the cremation certificates. Dr. Adams replied, that wasn't done wickedly. We always want cremations to go off smoothly for the dear relatives. Despite this concern, the picture the police had built up was not a pretty one. At the very least, Dr. Adams was an avaricious, greedy legacy hunter. He had been born in Ulster on the 21st of January, 1899 and grew up there during the tensions which were to lead to the division of Ireland shortly after the First World War. As the war ended, Adams enrolled as a medical student at Queen's University, Belfast. He was remembered as a solitary student who got a good degree. After qualifying, Adams began looking for a job in England. He found one with a large practice in Eastbourne and moved there in 1922, accompanied by his mother and sister. Adams was to be dominated by his mother until she died in 1945. He never married and broke off his only engagement because she did not approve of the girl. One escape which Adams did cultivate over the years to compensate for his mother's consuming presence was speed. He was always obsessed with fast cars. By the early 1930s, Dr. Adams had become one of Eastbourne's most fashionable doctors. He gradually took over the practice until he employed three other doctors. He specialized particularly in the wealthy but aging rich who flocked to the genteel Sussex town. In 1935, there was a whiff of scandal when the family of one widow attempted to prevent Adams receiving 3,000 pounds in her will. Adams took them to the high court and won but questions were starting to be asked. Certainly he had now developed expensive tastes which needed supporting. His suits came from Savile Row and his guns were made for him at Purdy's. He was a member of a gourmet dining club. Late in November, Detective Inspector Hannam and his men went to Kent Lodge with a search warrant under the Dangerous Drugs Act. Adams denied that he kept a drugs book, but was forced to admit that the list of drugs which the police had compiled from local chemists was correct. These showed that he had prescribed an enormous number of prohibited drugs to Mrs. Edith Morell, the widow of a rich Liverpool businessman, who had left Adams his first Rolls Royce. Adams admitted that he had administered most of the drugs and was unable to explain where any left over had gone. Adams was brought before Eastbourne magistrates on 13 charges of issuing misleading cremation certificates and failing to keep proper control of drugs. He was granted bail but forced to surrender his passport. Finally, on the 19th of December, 1956, Dr. Adams was arrested at Kent Lodge before a mass of journalists who had been tipped off. He seemed stunned and confused, and at one point remarked, murder, murder, I did not think you could prove murder, she was dying in any event. He was taken to Brixton Prison 
and from there, just after New Year 1957, back to Eastbourne to be committed for trial. The prosecution case was presented by Melford Stevenson, QC. Somewhat surprisingly, the magistrates allowed him to link the Morell case with the deaths of Mr. and Mrs. Hullett, so as to give the impression that Dr. Adams was a systematic poisoner. Even more surprisingly, since Adams had not been accused of anything in the Hullett's case, Melford Stevenson was allowed to mention in open court that a nurse claimed to have seen Adams giving a fatal dose of morphine to Mr. Hullett. Faced with this, it was hardly surprising that the magistrate sent Dr. Adams for trial. Nevertheless, even at this stage in the Adams case, there were those who were disquieted by the implications of this decision. Doctors are no more immune from the urge to murder than any other people. One of the century's most notorious cases was that of Dr. Hawley Harvey Crippen, who murdered his wife with hyacinth in 1910. Another case hit the headlines in northern England in 1935 when two dismembered bodies were revealed as the wife and children's nursemaid of Dr. Buck Ruxton. In neither of these cases was there any real doubt that brutal murders had taken place, nor was there in 1954 when Dr. Sam Shepard was arrested for killing his wife. The only question was whether it had been done by him or an intruder, as he always claimed. Shepard was sentenced to life imprisonment. But 10 years later, the US Supreme Court overturned his conviction and ordered a retrial. At this, he was found not guilty. A curiously similar mirror image of the Shepard case occurred a few years later, also in the United States, when the family of an army doctor, Jeffrey MacDonald, was slaughtered, also apparently by an intruder. MacDonald was accused of the murders but found not guilty by a court-martial. Ten years later, he was arrested again, retried, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Once again, in these latter cases, the fact of murder was not in question, only who did it. The peculiar problems which can occur when a doctor is accused of murder did not arise. Where do providing reasonable relief from extreme pain or refraining from action to prolong a terminally ill patient's life turn into murder? And what happens if perfectly correct treatment in an emergency fails to work and later comes to be seen as deliberate murder? The latter question was to arise almost exactly 10 years later in a sensational American case in Sarasota, Florida. On the 23rd of July, 1965, Dr. Carl Coppolino was accused of murdering his wife, Carmela. She had apparently died of a heart attack some months before. Initially, there had been no suspicions and she had been buried without an autopsy. The Coppolinos had recently moved to Florida from New Jersey. The doctor's new neighbors saw his wife's death as a tragedy and was somewhat surprised when, within six weeks of it, he had married again and continued to revel in the Florida good life. The bombshell came on the 28th of October, 1965, when a former neighbor from New Jersey, Marge Faber, appeared and told the police that she suspected Coppolino of murdering his wife so as to marry again. Faber's story was complicated by the fact that she revealed that she had been the doctor's mistress and had watched him smother her own husband, Colonel William Farber, while he was dangerously ill from an apparent heart attack. A heart attack which had in fact been induced by poisons administered by Dr. Coppolino. After both bodies had been exhumed, Coppolino was charged with murder, both in New Jersey and Florida. His first trial began in Monmouth County, New Jersey, on the 5th of December, 1966. The post-mortem on Colonel Faber had come up with little except a fractured cartilage in his neck, which might just have been caused by strangulation. Coppolino's counsel, the veteran F. Lee Bailey, was able to point out that Marge Faber had never suggested that Coppolino had strangled her husband. He was able to present her as a jilted and jealous ex-mistress out to cause any trouble she could. 
Coppolino gave a measured and convincing explanation of his actions, presenting a picture of a conscientious doctor eventually thwarted by his patient's refusal to follow his instructions. The New Jersey jury found him not guilty, and he returned to Florida to face what seemed the less serious charge. For the Florida prosecution had the problem that the post-mortem on Coppolino's wife had come up with few traces of drugs which might not reasonably have been administered by a doctor in an emergency. Coppolino again argued that he had acted throughout as a responsible physician. But this time the jury was more impressed by Marge Farber's story. Lee Bailey's portrayal of her as a vindictive woman out to ruin her former lover was less successful. On the 28th of April, 1967, Dr. Carl Coppolino was found guilty of murder in the second degree. He was sentenced to life imprisonment. Many, including Lee Bailey, found this a strange decision, since second-degree murder in the United States assumes lack of premeditation, and poisoning is the one method of murder which must logically imply some planning and premeditation. No such thing as a second-degree conviction, excuse me. But the prosecutor had his own explanation for the jury's decision. Being as the case was circumstantial, and the defendant did not testify, any possibility of a capital conviction was eliminated. I don't know if it must be a very rare case where if a defendant does not testify, he's convicted of a capital charge. So uh, with the development of that and the fact that the case was circumstantial, we were, had no anticipation that the jury would return a capital verdict. And I think they were, they were uh, certainly uh, justified in the verdict they returned. But F. Lee Bailey remained confident that he could get the verdict overturned. What leads you to believe that compromise was reached? Because there is no room for anything but first degree. It's first degree or nothing. The state claimed that uh, he poisoned his wife. You cannot poison somebody, especially with a drug that takes a long time to die, unless you do it coldly and with deliberate premeditation. The jury says that he did not. Now, this obviously resulted from somebody who wanted to find him guilty and somebody who wanted to find him not guilty, and they agreed on something in the middle. Are you confident of winning an appeal? <clears throat> oh, yeah. But this optimism was misplaced, and Dr. Carl Coppolino spent 12 years in prison before being paroled. It was with these sorts of misgivings in some people's minds about how doctors should be charged in certain circumstances that the trial of Dr. John Bodkin Adams began at the Old Bailey on the 18th of March, 1957. The Attorney General, Sir Reginald Manningham Buller, had decided to lead the prosecution himself. The presiding judge was Patrick Devlin. Razor sharp and with a biting wit, Devlin was known to have little respect for the Attorney General. The defense was led by Geoffrey Lawrence QC, who made no secret of his concern that press behavior during the police investigations had severely prejudiced the chances of his client receiving a fair trial. The prosecution case was that Adams had latched onto Mrs. Morell, giving her larger and larger doses of heroin and morphine, and persuading her to alter her will so as to leave him jewelry, silver, and her Rolls Royce. Chemist's records show that Dr. Adams had received massive amounts of heroin and morphine during the days leading up to Mrs. Morell's death, and all had apparently been given to her. Then the senior of the four nurses who had looked after Mrs. Morell was put in the box. Nurse Helen Stronach described movingly how the elderly patient had become rambling and semi-conscious. She testified that she and the other nurses had never been present when the doctor injected his patient. When Geoffrey Lawrence rose to cross-question her, he seemed sympathetic that the nurse was being asked to remember things from so long ago. She confirmed that she and the other nurses had kept detailed records of what had been administered to Mrs. Morell, but sadly, these had disappeared years before. Lawrence remarked regretfully that if this had not happened, an absolutely accurate record would have existed. Nurse Stronach seemed put out by this reflection on her memory. Yes, but you have our word for it, she told him. One of the defense team then came into court carrying a package. From it, Lawrence took three exercise books and asked the nurse to identify them. They were the missing records, found tucked away at the Morell's house by an alert defense clerk. 
Now Nurse Stronach was made to read her own account of the last two weeks of Mrs. Morell's life. On one particular day, when she had previously described the patient as rambling and semi-conscious, the record showed her as having been bright and enjoying a lunch of partridge, celery and pudding, washed down with a brandy and soda. Stronach was thoroughly discredited. Then Nurse Randall, who had previously claimed that Adams had given Mrs. Morell a large injection on that last evening and that she had administered a second dose at two in the morning shortly before Mrs. Morell died, was now confronted with her own notes. These showed that the doctor's syringe had been filled with paraldehyde, a comparatively safe sleep inducer. There was no mention of a second injection. Presented with this disarray in the prosecution's case, Lawrence began the defense by asking for the case to be dismissed. When the judge refused to allow this, Lawrence said that he saw no reason to subject Dr. Adams to the ordeal of being called in his own defense. The notebooks were enough to show that the prosecution had no proper evidence of an attempt to murder Mrs. Morell. This point was picked up by Judge Devlin in his summing up. While agreeing that it was not a very pretty story, he remarked, but not all fraudulent rogues are murderers. He ended by echoing the doctor's own words. Murder, but can you prove it? On the 17th day of what was then the longest trial in British legal history, the jury withdrew. They were back in only 44 minutes to find Dr. John Bodkin Adams not guilty. The lone Fleet Street voice against the press witch hunt, Percy Hoskins, now got Dr. Adams' exclusive story. The Attorney General announced that he would not now be bringing forward any other cases against Dr. Adams. Sir Reginald was to be severely criticized for the way in which this one had been prepared and conducted. Adams himself pleaded guilty at Lewis Assizes to 14 charges of professional misconduct in his handling of drugs. In November 1957, he was struck off the medical register by the disciplinary board of the General Medical Council. All through his time in custody, Dr. Adams had received gifts, letters of support, and even further legacies from his patients. They did not desert him now, and he continued to treat the wealthy of Eastbourne until he was reinstated as a doctor in 1961. He lived until November 1983, devoting an increasing amount of his time to shooting and becoming president of the Clay Pigeon Shooting Association. When Adams died, he left some 400,000 pounds to be divided between 47 beneficiaries, many of them friends who had stood by him during his trial. Uniquely, in 1985, the trial judge, Lord Devlin, as he had then become, published his own book. His conclusion was that Adams might well have told the nurses that the final injections contained paraldehyde, when in fact they contained something stronger. The drug had a distinctive smell, which none of them mentioned. Lord Devlin concluded that Adams was probably a mercenary mercy killer, a man who did not see himself as a murderer, but a dispenser of death to mortally ill patients. But any possibility of justifying this euthanasia morally was dispelled by the fact that Adams saw no reason why he should not profit from helping his elderly patients have a quiet and painless end. The question of when a doctor's wish to help his terminally ill patients and save them from unnecessary pain shades over into murder is one which continues to be argued about to this day. <laughs>